Hiya and welcome to Serena Speaks and today we're going to go over chapter 7 of the BNF which is the genitourinary system and in this um, particular chapter what um, it covers is for example bladder and urinary disorders, contraceptives, um, vaginal conditions, um, erectile dysfunction so as a topic, it's not actually too hard to get your head around um, compared to some of the other chapters. Um, so let's start off with bladder and urinary disorders. So there's many different examples of bladder and urinary disorders. They are, for example, incontinence, urinary frequency or even enuresis, which is, for example, bedwetting. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a bit. So now if a person does present with example um, incontinence or urinary frequency, what can we do to help them? So that we can try and give them um, pelvic floor exercises to practice at, um, which is known to be quite effective. Might even um, give them bladder training, or they might need drug therapy. And if they need drug therapy, typically an anti-muscarinic is given. So something like oxybutamine, um, they might just get, decide to give, the, pre um, the prescribed one might decide to give a modified release preparation, because then that decreases the risk of side effects. Um, might give something like tolteridine, again another anti-muscarinic, or one of the newer anti-muscarinics might be given, for example solifenacin. And remember with anti-muscarinic, our anti-muscarinic side effects, so constipation, dry eyes, um, dry mouth, um, remember the anti-muscarinic side effects are very key to know throughout the whole of the BNF. Um, as well as that, you might decide to give something like duloxetine. Now, duloxetine can be used for depressive illness, but it is also licensed to be used in moderate to severe stress incontinence, but only in females. It's only licensed for moderate to severe incontinence in females only. Um, moving on from that, let's talk about enuresis a bit more. So bedwetting. And in under five-year-olds, it's quite common However, an over five-year-old um, might decide to give some um, either drug therapy or some changes. For example, advice on fluid intake, um, dietary changes, toilet behaviour. Um, but yes, if this isn't effective, then what can also be given to the child is something called an enuresis alarm. And the way that this works is it's attached onto the child's underwear and when the child dispels um, some urine, the alarm will go off. So this will alarm those, um, for example, the parents, guardians and the child themselves that, OK, they're about to wet the bed. So it wakes them up and then they can go to the toilet and get rid of all the urine in the toilet then. And whilst this is effective in some children, in some it isn't. And so we might need to give drug therapy, for example, desmopressin. And only if the alarm really isn't effective is then desmopressin given alone. Now, whilst um, desmopressin can be quite effective, it needs to be um, you need to be aware that it can the main side effect. Um, well, not the main side effect, but a side effect to be very weary of that it can cause is hyponatremic convulsions, and that when a child is getting used, is, is their, their symptoms of better wetting are getting better, then the um, desmopressin needs to be withdrawn very gradually. Now, if a child is experiencing daytime symptoms, then they can be given desmopressin with an anti-muscarinic. And if all else fails and nothing is working, then the last resort medication is imipramine. Now, imipramine, it's a tricyclic antidepressant and it's not regularly used, it is the last resort medicine. Um, and something to be weary of with imipramine is that you can get withdrawal symptoms after stopping. So that's something to be aware, um, to be aware of. So moving on to urinary retention. Now, if it's acute, it can be treated by catheterization. But if it's a case of, for example, benign prostatic hyperplasia, so BPH, um, this can be um, resolved either through surgery or alpha blockers, for example, duasteride, finasteride. And other examples of alpha blockers are tamsulosin and um, doxazosin. Now, with tamsulosin in particular, it's one of those medicines where Yes, it's prescription only medicine, but it can be given over the counter under certain conditions. And it's up to the pharmacist to assess the patient and see if they're suitable for over the counter tamsulosin. 
So first and foremost, they must be a 45 to 75 year old male with um, BPH. And you would give them a two week supply initially. And if after the two weeks, the patient says, yes, they're getting benefit from this medicine, then you can supply them with a further four weeks. But within this time, it's still important that they go and see their GP um, to see if um, long term therapy is necessary for them. However, if after the initial two weeks apply, the patient comes to you and they say they're not getting any benefit at all or their symptoms are getting worse, then they need to stop taking the medicine and see their GP. And the way that tamsulosin and doxorosin work is by relaxing smooth muscles in BPH. Um, and if in the cases of males with large prostates, then something like tadalafil can be very effective. Now, it's worth mentioning with alfuzosin and pros prosocin um, that these are also effective but a key side effect of them is postural hypotension upon the first dose being given so it's important to warn the patients that when they if they are prescribed this medicine that to take it while sitting down be upright while taking it and if then they need to get up to get up very slowly to prevent them from getting any head rushes dizziness or even ultimately collapsing. Now talking about urological pain, so in the case of pain we could give for example an NSAID such as diclofenac um, as an injection or as, an, or as a suppository. You can give pethidine, um, you might give lidocaine gel for urethral pain and in the cases of cystitis, cystitis which is very common amongst women, um, you want to give something alkali. So, for example, you can recommend cranberry juice or um, citric acid or potassium citrate. But if you are recommending potassium citrate, you need to be careful with hyperkalemia because it's potassium going into the body. You don't want their potassium levels to get too high. But you could also recommend sodium bicarbonate because this acts as a good um, urinary alkalinizing agent. So moving on to bladder installations and neurological surgery. So this particular section, um, I think the best way to sort of learn it is know what the condition is and then know what the treatment option is for it. So let's break it down into three parts. You've got bladder infections, there's bladder cancer and there's urological surgery. So bladder infections, you can give aqueous chlorhexidine, but this isn't again, um, effective against um, pseudonymous bacteria. So um, you can give sodium chloride 0.9% solution and um, this can also help with blood clots. There's also bladder cancer and you might give doxorubicin or mitomycin installations. And if a person has recurrent bladder carcinoma in situ, then installations of BCG can be given. And in the case of urological surgery, you would give glycine irrigation solution 1.5%. So moving on to contraceptives, and this is probably the bulkiest and most content heavy subsection in this chapter. So with contraceptives, we have hormonal contraceptives, and they're particularly effective for adolescents who are for adolescents after menstruation. Um, we also have intrauterine uterine devices and barrier methods. So for example, um, condoms, femidoms, um, diaphragms, and these are less effective and they're best used with, um, for example, a spermicide. So talking more into the combined oral contraceptives, they contain an estrogen and a progestogen. And the estrogen typically used is, can be ethanolestradiol, the progestogen that can be used is usually either gestadine, desogesterol, or drosperinone. Now, if drosperinone is being used, you need to watch out and be careful for hyperkalemia because it's actually a derivative of spironolactone. Now, all of these can be used in combination with ethanolestradiol, and um, they're usually used in females who are at risk of headaches, acne, or breakthrough bleeding. Now, these um, combined oral contraceptives, they are reliable, they're reversible, they reduce the risk of, uh, well, they reduce dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia, um, and they can also reduce the risk of ovarian and endometrial cancer. However, they increase the risk of breast cancer, um, cervical cancer and VTE.
So in what state, in what examples would we need to give a lower strength preparation? And in what examples would you need to give a higher strength preparation? So a lower strength preparation would need to be given or is recommended for patients who are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Whereas a higher strength preparation would be beneficial for a patient who's experiencing breakthrough bleeding, um, particularly with um, monophasic preparations. So you can get um, monophasic and phasic. And the reason that a patient might be on a phasic preparation is usually because they're experiencing breakthrough bleeding with monophasic or they don't have a withdrawal bleed. Now, what's the difference between monophasic and phasic? Well, if you think of a pack of um, contraceptives, and let's, let's talk about the 21 day ones. So we've got 21 days, 21 days, 21 days. It comes as a pack of 63 typically. And as an example, yes, let's use Yasmin tablets. So these are um, monophasic. So what that means is that every pack of 21 contains um, 30 micrograms of ethanol estradiol and three milligrams of drosperinone, every single pack of 21. If we think about now phasic, um, so for example, triadine, that means that within that pack, some of them will contain ethanol estradiol, 30 micrograms, and gestadine, 50 micrograms, whereas some of the tablets will contain ethanol estradiol, 40 micrograms, and gestadine, 70 micrograms. So with phasic, they have differing um, amounts of the estrogen and progesterone, whereas with monophasic, they have the same amounts in every single tablet. Um, so on in the BNR 17, on page 680, they give so many different examples of the combined oral contraceptive monophasic 21 day preparation, the 28 day preparations, um, and the phasic 21 day preparation, 28 day preparations. So it's worth having a look at that. Um, other examples of um, combined oral contraceptives are transdermal patches, nuva rings, um, vaginal rings, um, EVRA patches. So now in the case of surgery, if it's elective surgery, i.e. the patient knows that on this day, at this time, I'm going to have surgery and they're on a combined oral contraceptive, they will need to stop taking that four weeks prior to their surgery and a progestion only pill could be offered to them as an alternative. However, if it's the case of trauma, i.e. they've been brought in that day um, and they didn't know that they were going to have surgery, then thromboprophylaxis needs to be given. So either in the form of low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. And they can also be given um, compression hoiseries um, if applicable to them. So now we need to think about in what instances we need to immediately stop taking combined oral contraceptives or um, hormone replacement therapy. So I think the best way, because there's quite a few points to remember and it's quite an important part to remember, I think the best way to remember this is to think of a really unfit person, um, someone who never runs, never exercises, someone like me, um, running up a mountain. So just imagine I'm running up this mountain and <sighs> I'm starting to get breathless running up this mountain. Okay, that's one point. Oh, I'm starting to get now really severe chest pain, um, really hurting because I'm getting breathless, getting this chest pain. That's another point to immediately stop taking the combined oral contraceptive. OK, um, I'm starting to run and the colour of my face is starting to change because I'm just getting so hot and everything. So colour changes, so jaundice, um, patient can even get hepatitis because I'm running so much um, my, and my heart is racing, my blood pressure is going really high. And if a patient is on um, a combined oral contraceptive or a HRT and their blood pressure goes beyond 160 over 95, they need to stop taking it. Um, because I'm running so much, my leg is starting to hurt, my um, calf is starting to hurt, I'm getting severe pain in there. Um, it's funny because I'm like pointing at my leg, but you can't even see it. But yeah, my leg is starting to really hurt. OK, so if a patient gets swelling in their calf, particularly in one leg, or they get pain in their calf, again, they immediately need to stop. Um, my stomach's starting to hurt because all this running is making me hungry. And so now my stomach is hurting. That's another reason to immediately stop taking it. So um, oh, and also I'm running, I'm running, running. And my head is starting to hurt because it's just pounding now from all this running because I'm just not used to it. Again, if a person gets a severe headache or a prolonged headache, um, again, they need to stop taking it. So 
Hopefully, with that little scenario, you will remember those key points. And it's worth noting that, um, as we mentioned beforehand, a patient is at risk of getting, for example, um, breast cancer, cervical cancer. But actually, after five years of stopping their combined oral com um, contraceptive, um, in five years' time, their risk of cervical cancer reduces. And after 10 years, their risk of breast cancer reduces. So that's something to, to note. And in questions, they love to know um, what the main monitoring points are for particular medicines. And for um, contraceptives, one of the key monitoring um, points that you need to do is check the patient's blood pressure. So start getting used to when you're dispensing and handing out contraceptives to patients. Start getting into the, the habit of asking them, when was the last time you got your blood pressure taken? Because it's so important that that is monitored. So then we have the parenteral progesterone only contraceptives. So, for example, we have the brand name um, Depo-Provera, which is um, methadroxy progesterone, and that can be given as an injection and it's long acting. You also have um, Noristat, which is norethisterone, and that again can be given as an injection, as an oily injection. It's long acting and it can provide contraceptive benefits for eight weeks. And it's worth noting that combined oral contraceptives interact with enzyme inducers, whereas progesterone only um, pills, IUDs, these parental contraceptives, they don't interact as much. Um, you also have Nexplanin, which is an etnogesterol releasing implant. It's inserted into the upper arm and it can stay there for three years, but you might get bruising and itching at the insertion site, which is normal. Um, and you also get IUDs, um, so IUD progesterone only, so these intrauterine devices. And the way that they work is they release levongesterol, and this can be used for primary menorrhagia. Now, IUDs are less appropriate for those at risk of, um, at increased risk of pelvic inflammatory disease, for example, under 25 year olds. But they do prevent endometrial proliferation, so they do reduce the risk of cancer. You also have copper IUDs and the benefits that copper IUDs have over normal IUDs is that they, or the IUD progesterone only, is that they reduce the risk of pelvic inflammatory disease. They um, reduce in blood loss and they can improve in, um, they should have improvement in dysmenorrhea. So moving on to emergency contraceptives. So we're, as a pharmacist, you will need to interview the patient and um, assess them and see if they are suitable for an emergency contraceptive and if they are, then which one. So the RPS has a whole load of guidelines and information um, to help you assess in which conditions you can give the emergency contraceptive. If you just type in 11L RPS guidance or guidelines, um, a whole load of information will come up. But to name a few, you've got levengesterol, which is 11L, and that um, brand name 11L, and that should be given within 72 hours for a sexual encounter. You have uliprestyl acetate, which is LO1, and that should be given within 120 hours. And you have IUD, the copper IUD, again, should be given within 120 hours. And you usually give it with something like azithromycin um, to reduce the risk of any STIs. So as we mentioned before, the combined oral contraceptives do interact with enzyme inducers. Enzyme inducers, for example, carbamazepine, fampicin, um, St. John's wort. And it's not recommended to be on a combined oral contraceptive whilst taking an enzyme inducer or 28 days after stopping an enzyme inducer. And for patients with HIV, they would benefit from, um, say, a condom and a long acting method. Now, in terms of missed pills with combined oral contraceptives, if you take, if you forget to take your pill, take it as soon as you remember. Usually it should be within 12 hours. Now, if it's been longer than that, then take another, but you need to take extra protection for seven days thereafter. And so usually the pills come um, as 21 days. Um, however, if you miss a pill within the last seven days, i.e. days 14 to 21, then don't take a break and start your next pack. So usually you take the 21 um, days worth of pills, you take a seven day break and then you start on the next pack. But like I just said, if within the seven, those, the last, within 14, day 14 to 21, if you forget to take it, then don't have that seven day break, just start on the next pack. 
And if you're sick within 12 and um, within two hours of taking a combined oral contraceptive, take another one. With progesterone only pills, for example, levogesterol, um, if you've missed a pill, you can take it within three hours, but then you'll need to use additional methods, for example, barrier methods. If you vomited within two hours, you need to take another pill. And if you've had persistent vomiting or diarrhea or you've missed the pill after three hours, then you need additional protection for at least two days. So additional protection for two days. Now with Ulipristal, if vomiting occurs within three hours, take a replacement dose. And with Desingesterol, it works for 12 hours. So if you miss a pill, um, make sure to take it within 12 hours. Now in terms of travelling, so a person taking um, a contraceptive pill, we know that they're increased risk of VTE. And when you're travelling, you're also at increased risk of VTE. So if a person is on a pill and they're travelling, they're at they need to um, either wear compression stockings, exercise on the plane, wear compression hoiseries um, to all prevent risk of VTE or even DVT. Um, those that are particularly at risk are those that are obese um, or increase in age. And during the first year you're at, of taking the pill, you're at a higher risk of VTE. So now that was all contraceptives. Um, now let's focus on erectile and, and ejaculatory conditions. So what can cause erectile dysfunction? The way to remember it is PEN-V. So it can be psychological, it can be endocrine um, abnormalities, it can be neurological, or it could be vascular. Now, there are some drug treatments that are available on the NHS for erectile dysfunction, but they must be endorsed with SLS or must be marked as SLS. Now, um, an example that can be given is alprostadil, and this can be given as intraurethral, urethral, yeah, intraurethral application or even as a topical application. If it is used as a topical application and the um, patient wants to have a sexual encounter, then they must wear a condom and they need to be counsel the patient's exposure, particularly to women or, who are pregnant or of childbearing age. Um, and if priapism occurs, then this needs to be treated within six hours. You also have your phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors, so your fills, tadalafil, sildenafil. Sildenafil is Viagra, but it can also be licensed in pulmonary hypertension at a dose of 20 milligrams three times a day. And for premature ejaculation, what's usually given is an SSRI, which is dipoxetine. That's dipoxetine is the one that is given for premature ejaculation. So moving on to obstrix. So with obstrix, you use a prostaglandin and an oxytocic. Now, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I'm just saying it how I spell it. So oxytocic. And that can be used in inducing abortion or labour, and it can help minimise blood loss um, from the placenta. Now, in terms of induction of um, abortion, so you can use a prostaglandin, for example, gemiprost, and that can come as um, a vaginal pessary. Or you can use um, misoprostol. Misoprostol is one that they like to use in exams because it should not be used in pregnant women and should not be used in women of a childbearing age. Um, but it can, because it can induce abortion. Um, unless, of course, the aim is to induce abortion. But in women who are pregnant and who don't want an abortion and in females of a childbearing age, you need to avoid misoprostol. And it can be taken orally via the buccal cavity or sublingually, or it can also be given as a vaginal tablet as well. Um, you also have something called mifepristone, and you need to carefully monitor blood pressure and pulse three hours after giving. It's usually given as a single dose, and then you give a prostaglandin such as gemiprost um, after. Now, in terms of induction augmentation of labour, you have something like dinopristone, which comes as a vaginal tablet, pessary and gel, or you have oxytocin. And oxytocin um, is usually given by slow IV infusion. However, if large amounts are given, it can cause excessive fluid retention, therefore causing water intoxication with hyponatremia. So the way to avoid this is to use electrolyte containing diluent, so i.e. avoid glucose, don't use glucose. So use instead an electrolyte containing diluent and um, restrict fluid intake. 
Um, and in terms of prevention and treatment of hemorrhage, so for example, bleeding due to a miscarriage um, or abortion, um, this can be controlled using ergometrine, malleate and oxytocin. And that's usually given IM. And the two in combination are more effective than if one is given alone. If unresponsive, then carbo carboprost can be given. Um, and if all else fails and nothing else is working, then you give misoprostol, but that would be unlicensed. In terms of premature labour, you want to give a myometrial relaxant. So to tocolytic drugs, um, they postpone premature labour um, with the aim to reduce harm to the child. And you have, for example, atotosiban, atosiban, which is an oxytocin receptor antagonist, and that's usually used between 24 to 33 um, weeks gestation. Or you have nifedipines, um, which is a calcium um, channel blocker. And with atosiban and nifedipine, they both have less side effects than, for example, a beta 2 agonist. Now, beta 2 agonists, we know, salbutamol, terbutaline, and they can actually be used in uncomplicated premature labour between 22 to 37 weeks of gestation um, to cause a delay in delivery of up to 48 hours. Um, and you also have an Indomethacin, which is unlicensed, it's a COX-2 inhibitor, and that can be used when a beta-2 agonist is inappropriate. So the last part in this chapter that we're going to go over is vaginal and vulval conditions. So you can give a topical preparation for symptomatic relief, or you might need to give a systemic drug, for example, an infection, if there's gonorrhea or syphilis as examples. So in terms of preparations for vaginal and vulval changes, you can give a um, estrogen containing topical creams, but you want to use the smallest effective dose, the shortest duration. And it's usually indicated to improve vaginal epithelium in menopausal um, atropic vaginitis. So atropic vaginitis, anything with itis at the end, um, refers to inflammation. So inflammation of the vagina and a decrease in um, lubrication. And for example, they can use um, they can also use modified release vaginal tablets or impregnated vaginal rings like estriol, as an example. You can also get non-hormonal preparations for vaginal atrophy, and some are um, available and prescribable on the NHS. Then we have um, vaginal and vulval infections. So if we start off with fungal infections, so candida, candidiasis, vaginal candidiasis, so ideally you want to give, you can give a cream and or a pessary. Ideally you want to give the combination of the two and the pessary should be inserted high up into the vagina. Um, it's usually imidazole drugs that are given. So for example, clotrimazole, meconazole. Um, and you want to use short course. So it should only be used for, um, you want to use a short effective course. So if usually um, for one to 14 days. Now, if um, compliance is a problem, for example, you can use a single dose um, preparation. For example, you have the um, oral treatment with fluconazole, um, and that's just a one off tablet that's usually given. Um, and uh, itraconazole can also be effective. In terms of vulval vaginal candidiasis in pregnancy, it can happen. You don't want to give um, an oral antifungal because they're pregnant, um, but you can treat with, um, again, pessaries, creams, um, again, imidazole, pessaries, creams, drugs, and should only be used for seven days if they're pregnant. Now, in cases where they a person is getting recurrent vulval vaginal um, candidiasis, it's usually likely to a predisposing factor. So it could be due to diabetes, pregnancy, um, other oral, um, con it could be due to oral contraceptives, in their partner might be a source of infection. So usually treatment against candida, can candida is extended for um, six months, but this has to be prescribed by the GP. Now, um, it's also worth noting that if a woman presents with um, with vaginal candidiasis more than twice in six months, then they need to be referred onto their GP. So remember in what situations, um, with which over-the-counter situations, you need to then refer the patient onwards and in which cases you don't need to refer them and you can give them something available. Uh, in terms of other infections, so for example, viral infections like herpes, you would give um, a cyclovir, famcyclovir, 
And if it's the case of bacterial vaginosis, um, you can give clindamycin, so you can give it as dalicin 2% cream, or you can give metronidazole 0.5% gel. Um, and even lactic acid can be given with the brand name um, Relact Relactigel. So that's chapter seven. So I think it's probably one of the easier, dare I say, easier chapters to go over. I think the main um, bulky part of this chapter is, of course, the contraceptives and in which situations um, you need, if, like with the whole missed doses situation. So in which cases do they need to take their another tablet within two hours? When do they need to take it three hours? When do they need to take it in 12 hours? And that is something that they do like to ask you and trip you up on. Um, so that is worth knowing. Um, but yeah, again, it's one of those topics where I just keep going over and over again um, and it's quite a good topic in being able to see for yourself in practice so if you get a prescription for example aldopristol or sildenafil or tadalafil has it been marked as SLS if it's um, a contraceptive has it been marked on the prescription as CC um, little things like that which you need to know for the exam but also for real life as well so I hope you found this video useful and if you have then why not give it a thumbs up, give it a like, share with your buddies, um, subscribe and for all the latest information um, come and join our Facebook page as well and until next time good luck with your revision and happy revisings.